All right, we are live. A special afternoon edition of Coffee with Rich. Not to take away from tomorrow morning, we'll be joined from Manhar in South Africa, who is with Dragon Protection Services. He's going to be discussing with us the ongoing riots in his country and what are some things that we as Americans can take away from it. But today I'm joined by Pete Labber. And as we're waiting for folks to jump on, <clears throat> let's talk about some sponsors that keep this, this little show on the road. <clears throat> Mike Seekland and I are very fortunate to have sponsors like Century Martial Arts, makers of the Bob XL. Want to take your striking game to the next level? You know, I've heard, I've said it a million times. Use the Bob XL. You can also use the Bob as a good shooting target. Uh, Bob doesn't mind. He's a great three-dimensional target for that. We also have APPHemp.com, which is AppalachianStandard.com. My good friend Jesse Ross and I were in the Marines together, and now him and his family are growing some amazing hemp products in the mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. Also have the Cool Fire Trainer. Cool Fire Trainer, you've heard me talk about it before. Your sights, your trigger, your firearm. Insert a new barrel, barrel spring, and you can take your dry fire training to the next level with Cool Fire Trainer. We also have Mountain Man Medical, maker of the co-branded trauma kit. My good friend, Marsoc operator Justin Carroll and I sit down and put together an amazing trauma kit for you. If you got a family member that's going back to college in the fall, you may want to hook them up with a good trauma kit, and ours is an outstanding one. We also have Precision Holsters, makers of the Ultra Appendix holster that I and Mike use, as well as the competition line that I use as well. Want to I tell you what, you will not be disappointed by using the Precision Holsters. They have, they're American-made. They worry about comfort, quality, and value. You have a problem wrong with the Precision Holsters product, send it back for a full refund. They also have amazing tactical belts as well looks like we have will Rhodes is on it says hey rich and pete walt davis says hey rich coin number 138 if you want to know what a coin number is you're going to, have to check out the american warrior society.com for all your self-defense needs and walt says love working with my bob will is on from jackson missouri please hit that share button before we get started here in just a second i'm going to read pete's amazing bio and uh Matter of fact, let's do that now, sir. Pete Blaver commanded at every level of one of the most elite counterterrorism organizations in the world during most of the recent history's most significant military and political events, i.e. Panama, Colombia, Somalia, Bosnia, Afghanistan, and Iraq. In 2006, he retired from the military and transitioned from leading elite combat teams around the globe to leading elite corporate teams for one of the world's largest and most innovative biotechnology companies. After 21 years of using the term common sense to describe the way he lived and led the military, this was the first time that he actually paused to ponder what common sense actually was and why people seem to recognize, respond to, and appreciate the term common sense leadership. He didn't have to look very far for the answer. The answer is both all around and inside us. It's not political or religious or philosophical. It's biological. Biology reveals that life always finds a way. It is the common sense way. In 2015, he left his job as biotechnology executive to write this book. In 2018, while still working on the book, he decided it was a time to pressure test the common sense way in the living laboratory of real world experience. So he started the international company that adds armor protection to any type of vehicle, i.e. trucks, cars, vans, buses, etc. The idea behind Add Armor is to create a mobile safe room that protects the vehicle's passengers from would-be attackers, criminals, terrorists, active shooters, and anarchists. Well, we need that today. I tell you, I'm reading that going, I need to get my vehicle. <laughs> While well, also providing peace of mind that cannot be attained in an unarmored vehicle. In today's mm -hmm. world, adding armor to protect your family, friends, and colleagues is common sense. It is the common sense way. Pete was born and raised in Oak Park, Illinois. He has a MBA and an MS in National Security and Strategic Affairs. Good afternoon, sir, and welcome to the show. Thanks. Great to be here, Rich. We have Way Ray joining us as even Rich and Pete. Hello from Belgium, coin number 2016. Hmm. Walt is on. Robert is on, coin number 1401 from Northern Kentucky. Greg Gomez from Texas. And Alan is Alan here from Occupied Virginia. Go ahead and hit that share button, folks. Pete, what is your bio overlook, sir? Uh, you, that was pretty good uh, summarization. I, I, you know, I just go back to, um, I'm the fortunate benefactor of what I've come to believe is one of life's most esteemed privileges. And that 
is the privilege of leading teams across continents, continents, cultures, and contexts. Um, I've had the privilege of leading international teams in Panama, Colombia, Somalia, Bosnia, Afghanistan, and Iraq while in the military, and then leading cross-functional teams in manufacturing, commercial, and research and development while in biotechnology. And of course, uh, start my own business, which was a dream of mine uh, to start a business and run a business all based on common sense. Um, so, you know, one of the one of the principles drilled into me by my military former military unit is that leadership, like life, is a privilege, and it's not a privilege not a privilege for those we lead, rather for those of us who are fortunate enough to experience and learn from it. And with privilege comes a responsibility to pay something back. Uh, you know, JFK said a long time ago, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And, you know, I, I was definitely um, a believer and follower of, of that principle. Uh, you know, I think most of my colleagues would say the same thing. Uh, we, served in the military to serve the country. Uh, and we recognized that we were fortunate enough to experience and learn lessons that uh, most people never get the opportunity or the chance to learn. And as, as mentioned, with privilege comes responsibility to pay something back. And that's really the motivation for writing uh, both of my first two books. Um, you know, as you mentioned, Rich, my new book is called The Common Sense Way. It's a book about common sense, uh, what it is, how we make it, and how to put it into practice across all contexts of leadership and life. Um, it's also a book of stories uh, from my real world leadership journey across the globe. And I add that because, you know, using stories to teach common sense is common sense. Uh, the way our brain works, which I'll talk about quite a bit today, uh, is not through rote factoids. Our brain learns in clusters and it requires context to um, make what we learn stick. So a story is like a web of knowledge uh, with, a, with a purpose to it. Uh, and when you learn something in a story, you're far better off for retaining that knowledge and uh, calling on it when you need it in the future. So, you know, the first part of my book is uh, is about my leadership journey, uh, which is, a, as you mentioned, it's a journey of discovery uh, across continents, cultures and contexts. And I say that because, you know, very few times you know, obviously I had many insights, but those insights are more or less the culmination of uh, repetition and experience and seeing the same thing in a different context from country to country to country. And um, that's why this first part of the book is where I explain uh, not just what I learned, but the biologic and evolutionary underpinnings of what I learned. Um, and, and that was the real revelation for me. Uh, so before I get into some of those, you know, back to you asked me, you know, what, what else about my, uh, my background? Well, you know, you mentioned I grew up in Oak Park, Illinois. Uh, I grew up in a family of nine right in the middle. Uh, you know, thank you, mom and dad. Had a great childhood, um, just a great place to grow up. Went to college at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois. Uh, some people choose their college for academic reasons. Some people choose it for sports. Uh, I chose mine because my college was located in the middle of a national forest. And, uh, you know, even though I didn't know I wanted to join the military when I went off to college, I didn't know anything about the military uh, other than really what I saw in the movies and read in books. Uh, even though I didn't know it, I was, I had this love affair with terrain and, and the wilderness. And I think that's a common denominator pattern of most, uh, first responders, uh, you know, of, of all ilk, 
they love terrain, they love geography, uh, they want to be part of that. And I know that's what drove me uh, to go down to Southern Illinois University. And I was never disappointed. Fantastic place to go to school. Uh, it was while I was there, my first year, uh, 1980, I think, that the Iran hostage rescue mission uh, went awry. And that was, you know, a Rubicon moment for me because uh, that was the first time that I actually paused uh, and to reflect on what an amazing life I had in the United States of America. Uh, what I believe then and still believe now is the greatest country that's ever existed. Um, and not just, you know, what it gave me, but my family, uh, you know, you, you grow up with love of family, you love your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your cousins. And, you know, so I was grateful, not just for what it gave me, but for my family and friends. Uh, and like I said, it was first time I reflected and, you know, it was also the first time I ever thought about, hey, what should I do about that? You know, I feel like I owe something to this country. And, you know, that failed Iran hostage rescue mission, I read everything I could about it uh, as the reports started coming out. And, you know, when I, when I read the first report, uh, it talked about um, three things. It talked about uh, being too uh, rigid with regards to compartmentalization and sharing knowledge. So as an example, uh, the helicopter pilots uh, and the tankers and the operators that ended up all on the ground together had never been all together at the same time. Uh, and they weren't connected during the process. It was so compartmented that they weren't connected. The other was bureaucracy and the third was just a over uh, over um, overemphasis and overuse of helicopters in planning. And, you know, I never forgot that. Uh, I felt like, you know, I, I remember feeling about those eight men that died uh, in the desert, you know, I, I, I just a sense of frustration uh, because they didn't, they weren't shot by the enemy. They were, you know, they died because of poor planning, bureaucracy, and just the unexpected. And so all that, you know, came together to drive me toward my decision, which I made. I was a marathon runner and triathlete at the time. I'd go on long runs every day trying to think of what I should do. Uh, and it, it didn't take long. You know, there weren't, there weren't many uh, options that compared to joining the military. But that was what I decided to do, uh, to go in the military. And I wanted to be a member of the unit that took part in that Iran hostage rescue mission. So, you know, I, I did what everyone did. I went to find a, a basic a drill, sorry, or a uh, recruiting station that would actually sign me up for what I wanted. I wanted to come in, uh, do basic training, OCS and infantry, but it was took me three recruiters to get someone to do that for me. Uh, and when I finally did, you know, it was off. Uh, I finished, I finished college and then went off into the military. And my first uh, tour of duty in the military was on the DMZ in Korea. Uh, it was amazing time to be on the DMZ, uh, 1985, I think. Um, and, you know, they were still shooting. There were, you went out on patrol at night, placed Claymore mines. Uh, but, you know, the biggest takeaway from Korea was understanding, uh, you know, the, the, physical, the physical reality of Korea. Uh, a lot of people don't know, but Seoul, which I think now is like 10 million people, is only 60 miles from the DMZ. So, so those 10 million people are actually in artillery range of North Korea. And so, you know, you remember a couple of years back, they had all the uh, peace initiative with uh, Kim Il-sung and, you know, some people were dismissive of that. It was a monumental uh, moment 
in world history. And the reason the South Koreans were so appreciative of it was what I just mentioned to you. And I just bring that up because I think a lot of times when we talk about uh, our military experience, we forget one of the things is this amazing exposure you get to all corners of the world. And, you know, you understand the geography, you understand the cultural realities, but more than that, you know, you understand the mindset of the people there. When you understand mindset and what motivates people, uh, you have a better chance of understanding how they're going to behave in the future. Uh, so after Korea, I went to uh, the Ranger Battalion uh, in Fort Lewis, Washington. And, you know, I was very fortunate in the early part of my career to work for some of the best leaders under some of the best leadership climates I could ever have hoped for. Uh, the military is at its best, a sprawling leadership academy. Um, and after a couple of years of attendance, uh, you've seen and heard about the importance of taking care of your people and doing the right thing uh, so many times over and over that it sticks with you for the rest of your life. Um, but hearing it and reading it on banners hanging in the hallway or in your auditorium only goes so far. Um, you know, to learn how to apply common sense to leadership, you have to see it in action. Uh, you need a mental model of what common sense leadership looks like in the real world. And I talk about that in the book in chapter seven. Um, and really the, my takeaway is common sense leadership is learned. Um, and, you know, common sense, luckily for us, common sense is contagious. So once you learn something that makes sense, you're going to instinctively repeat it. Uh, and that's why common sense, it's so important to talk about it, to bring it out in the open, to define it and to build our language and our leadership methodologies around it. Um, so, you know, back to those leaders, it was only while writing this book that I really began to appreciate how important those early leadership climates were to my, my leadership foundation for the rest of my career, not just military, but corporate. Um, you know, I, I don't think I ever, I, I, well, I know, I never again would work in such a healthy, productive leadership climate as the one I worked in as a lieutenant and captain in the Rangers. And, you know, that has everything to do with people. The battalion commander was amazing. The battalion XO, the Sar battalion sergeant major, Sergeant Major Leon Guerrero, uh, amazing, amazing guy. My first sergeant, uh, amazing, first Sergeant Magana. Uh, these were my company commander, Captain Gildner. These were people that, you know, they didn't, they didn't teach by telling us and lecturing us. They taught through their actions and behaviors and, and critically uh, through the choices they make. And, and that's really the hallmark of any leader. You can talk about leaders and we always stumble on words for how to describe leaders, but the, the only real litmus of competence with leaders is their ability to make decisions uh, and solve problems to accomplish the purpose that they have the privilege to lead for. Uh, and, you know, that includes not just your purpose, but the purpose of the people that work for you. Um, I can't, Let go me ahead. ask you this, Pete. Is this where the, was that the impetus for this book, The Mission, The Men and Me? Was that one of the commanders there at, at Rage Retain that sp spoke those words to you the first time? Uh, no, that was actually a different uh, commander. He was my battalion commander in Korea who, uh, who told me about the mission, the men and me, the priority, one M on top of the other. Uh, and, you know, even though it sounds like a simplistic formula, it's actually is very nuanced uh, because, you know, the mission is your purpose. And that's why everyone's there, uh, you know, when we talk about the mission or purpose, we're really talking about our people too, because that's why they're there. Our people, you know, whether you have a platoon, a company or a brigade, whatever in the military, they're not in that position 
because they want to work for you. They're in that position because they came into the military to accomplish a purpose. And that's why you're there too. It's your common purpose. And, you know, to, to prioritize the mission and your purpose is to prioritize your people. Um, because the only measure of success for them is that they get out of what they're in it for uh, instead of uh, being stymied in their efforts. Uh, and of course, me always comes last. It's a great reminder. Uh, you know, the military uh, in my time did an amazing job of, of you know, reinforcing leaders always eat last, uh, leaders always go last, and uh, unless it's something dangerous, and then, you know, you should go first or you should go with. Um, and, you know, that's why that uh, that principle was also very important to me. But, you know, these leaders showed me more about the climate. And, you know, I really believe that if you think about leadership climates, like you think of real climates, uh, it, you know, it really adds light to how important they are. Um, we live, we choose the places we live based on the climate, you know, what, whether it's the fertility of the soil, the amount of sun, the lack of rain, whatever, we pick it on a climate. When we find a climate we like, uh, we set down stakes and we stay there. Uh, when we find the climate we're in is inhospitable, all we think about is how to get away and where to go next. And, you know, that's, that's what I learned about leadership climates. Uh, if you really care about your purpose, you really care about the people you lead, then you will care deeply about creating a healthy leadership climate. And again, a healthy leadership climate, uh, the only way to judge it is by the sum total of choices the leaders make uh, in order to accomplish the purpose and take care of the people they lead. Uh, it's it's over time, but it's some total. And those choices are the ones we make in front of our people and as well as the choices we make behind closed doors. Uh, so, you know, I went off after commanding a company uh, in the 7th Infantry Division in Panama. I went off to selection. It was as early as I could go. Uh, that was 1991. And uh, obviously, I made it into the unit. And I stayed there for the next 13 years of my career. Um, it was an amazing time to be there. Again, uh, worldwide exposure, Colombia, Somalia, Bosnia, Afghanistan, Iraq. Um, and, you know, the unit takes kind of leadership to a PhD level. One of the things that I loved about it, and I think everybody loves about it, is from the time you get there to your last day, uh, the core principle of the unit is to use common sense. Uh, it's it's taught to you by the senior leaders. Uh, the language uh, that most operators use to, to communicate with each other is, um, you know, is full of common sense terms. Common, use common sense is usually the first thing you're told when you get a mission and the last guidance you get when you're walking out the door uh, on your way out to execute it. Um, so, you know, it was also a very powerful eye opener that, you know, this this way, which include the way the military, most of the military leads, um, that there is another way. And the other way is the common sense way. And And again, I didn't know really what that was yet or how to define it, but I knew uh, that there was something there. And, uh, and, you know, I was, I was learning it like everyone does in the military. It's a journey and you learn to adapt. Uh, that's an instinctive process of our brains. Uh, we're, we're hardwired to learn about what's going on around us. And the, the purpose of that learning is to adapt. In fact, learning itself is actually synonymous with adapting because every time we learn something new and so anyone uh listening today anything that's you learn new today actually changes physically changes uh the neurons in your brain 
Uh, every time you learn something new, your brain changes. That's what plasticity is. Neuroplasticity just means, you know, like neuroplastic, it, it's malleable, it moves. So we learn to adapt. And if you didn't change, you didn't learn a thing. So, you know, we've got a change going on inward, but that change that happens in our brain goes outward to, to our behaviors. If it doesn't, it means we didn't learn a, we didn't learn a thing. Um, so finally, 2005, I chose to retire from the military. Um, you know, we never make a major life choice based on one single variable, uh, whether the choice, choice involves changing jobs, changing houses, or changing relationships. Major life choices are never just about one thing. Instead, they're always about a whole bunch of things. And choosing to retire from the military after 22 years uh, was prima facie of this principle for me. Um, we live our lives and make choices about what to do next, similar to the way we manage our calendars uh, through multiple context lenses. Uh, think about the way you look at your calendar. You look at it through the lens of family, friends, professional, personal, spiritual, social, etc. Whatever you know, whatever your life entails. Uh, and so, even though we look at it differently, the choice that makes the most sense across all those contexts, and that coheres across those contexts, and adapts to what's going on around us, that's always the best decision. So. My decision to retire from the military and explore new frontiers uh, made sense across all contexts of my life. And that's that's why I did it. Um, of course, getting out, you know, as fortunate as I was to lead uh, some of the finest interagency and international teams ever assembled for combat. Uh, Fortune found me again in business. And, you know, I went into uh, the biotechnology industry, uh, which is full of great people, uh, full of a great, a great purpose to serve patients, um, and full of complexity. So, you know, there's, there's always a challenge. There's always something new, whether it's on the science side or the business side. And I loved that about that industry. Um, so a lot of people ask me what it was like going directly from leading combat teams in Afghanistan and Iraq to leading corporate teams in business. And, you know, my answer is the same then as it was now, and it, it was no big deal. And I loved every minute of it. Um, a lot of that credit goes to uh, my experiences in the military, uh, 13 years of showing up in countries and at embassies that I'd never been to before. Uh, I was well-versed in uh, how to operate in a strange, unfamiliar environment. Um, and, you know, I always remember uh, the first meeting I went to when I when I uh, got out and, uh, and and joined my uh, biotechnology company. Uh, I was sitting there and the the person talking, she looked exactly she looked and sounded exactly like uh, this person who happened to be in the CIA, who I sat in a meeting with a few months earlier in Budapest. And uh, she was taught, I was brand new, so I didn't know a lot. And she was talking about the launch of a new product. And uh, she was going into how important it would be to uh, take a beachhead uh, to make sure that we had reconnaissance people on the ground who would, uh, who would greet the people who took the beachhead and make sure we had overhead support for those people. So she, you know, she was using all these military metaphors and it was, you know, my first week and right away I could see this continuation of this pattern. Uh, and the pattern really was that people are people, um, you know, the haircuts, the outfits, uh, you know, change across contexts, but human nature is human nature. And, uh, you know, this was the first time I really saw it in, in such a, uh, in such, with a, such a stark uh, contrast and also how, uh, how synchronous it is across the context that, that you know, you're going to see the same mannerisms, the same behaviors, the same decision making. 
Uh, and that was the big insight, you know, um, whether combat business or life, um, you know, I learned through experience and confirmed through feedback that people all across the planet and all across time uh, recognize, respond to, and appreciate common sense leadership when they experience it. And that was really what set me off on this book. You know, why is that? Uh, why do we all recognize common sense, uh, yet none of us can come up with the same definition of common sense? Uh, you could ask, you know, 100 people what common sense is, you'll get 100. Uh, yeah, I know exactly what it is. And if you ask them to define it, you'll get 100 different definitions. So, you know, I set out to find out what leadership is and what its relationship was to common sense. And, you know, just like common sense, uh, most of us think we know what leadership is until someone asks us to actually define it. And then we find ourselves, for a, you know, at a loss of words. It's not because we don't know what leadership is. Rather, leadership, like common sense, is completely contextual. Uh, how do we know? All you have to do is think about leadership in the context of one of your own specific life circumstances. And that can be combat, uh, business, country, community, you name it. When we think about leadership in that context, most of us can describe in so many words, the attributes and behaviors of both great and not so great leaders. And it just proves we know good and bad leadership when we see, hear, or feel it. Uh, you know, not only is common sense the common ground, but we all recognize senselessness the same way too. And that's why we all complain about the same problems with leadership. Uh, but, you know, as the more I looked into it and specifically the biologic and, and evolutionary origins and underpinnings of leadership, the more I realized, you know, leadership has basically nothing to do with where we went to school or what degree we earned or what we look like or how tall we are or our gender. And you'll likely never hear any of those qualities used to describe the attributes of great leaders. What you will hear sooner or later in every description of every great leader is common sense. And all you got to do is ask yourself, have you ever known a great leader that wasn't a common sense leader? Um, so, you know, where does, where does leadership come from? We talked about common sense, but leadership is, is an evolutionary pattern of human behavior that emerged the moment the first few members of our species breathed their first few breaths. Uh, the first leaders weren't kings or queens, presidents or prime ministers, sirs or mams. The first leaders were parents. They were moms and dads. Uh, and, you know, English philosopher Thomas Hodge described their lives very appropriately as nasty, brutish, and short. Um, they lived their lives in the moment because every moment presented a survival choice. They either found something to eat or for heat and shelter or they starve, froze, and were eaten by something else. Find or fail, eat or be eaten, work together or perish. Uh, the purpose of our ancient ancestor parents was crystal clear to them, to do whatever it took to ensure they and their offspring survived, thrived, and evolved. And so success or failure as parents and leaders depended on their ability to take care of their people. Uh, not by coddling them. That's not what we're talking about here. And think about it. That's a parallel between uh, leadership and parenting. Uh, you know, our job as parents isn't to coddle our kids. It's to lead by example. It's to teach them right and wrong. Uh, it's allow them enough freedom to experiment and learn from their actions, but not too much where they wander off and get eaten by a saber tooth tiger. Can we unpack that a little bit, Pete? You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. So if you're joining us today, I want to say thank you. My name is Rich Brown, the co-host, co-founder of the American Warrior Society and the American Warrior Show, America's number one self-defense podcast. I'm a retired Marine Corps officer, former police officer, corrections and special operations officer. And I've got Pete Blabber, former commander of a special mission unit at base at Fort Bragg. And uh, we're discussing his new book coming out. I also want to welcome a couple of folks to the show, but I want to ask Pete a couple of questions 
after we welcome some folks to the show. Dr. T.C. Fuller says, hello from South Carolina, coin number 1620. Nice to see a fellow denizen of Chicken Road. He was 18th EOD. Jesse is on. Will is on. Brett, Ken, John. Bruce says, afternoon, gentlemen, from uh, coin number 481 from Michigan. Yeah, Pete, the, what I wanted to ask you about was, you know, in the Marine Corps, it's mission accomplishment and troop welfare. And I think the, a misunderstanding with troop welfare, because I'm, I'm hearing you say, you know, it's not about coddling them. I used to look at troop welfare like making sure that they're trained and equipped to the mission as being one of the greatest ways that you can take care of your people. Uh, was I misunderstanding that? No, I don't think so. I think, uh, you know, that goes back to the purpose. And that's yeah. why the two are indelibly linked. Uh, to accomplish your purpose, you have to take care of your people. And, you know, you can call it their welfare, you can call it anything else. Uh, welfare is one part of it, but, you know, <laughs> where the rubber hits the road in the military is your strategic and tactical decision making uh, because you can take care of their welfare. And if you get them killed in combat through uh, poor decision making, then, you know, you didn't accomplish your purpose of taking care of their welfare. So I think it's it's overarching. It's you know uh, it's continuous, and the best way to define it is really those the choices we make uh, have to cohere with that purpose, uh, that common purpose, and they have to adapt to what's going on around us in the context of the moment. So I think you know, and I'm just reading in a bit to your question. You know, the, the part of the equation we don't always get is that second part. You know, we think, hey, well, I've got I get that. I, you know, take care of the welfare of my people. But what does that mean? You can't answer it unless you have the context of the moment to answer it in, uh, because it's different, you know, across time and across situations that you that you experience. And I, I asked that question, Pete, because I think I see I, I saw uh, a Marine Corps and I can only speak to the Marine Corps, but, you know, the Marine Corps kind of going to well, troop welfare. We're going to have family day and we're going to give the guys Friday off and we're going to do all these fluffy things. And I'm like, really, that I don't know that those fluffy things are going to, you know, let these guys come back safe. You know what I'm saying? It just yeah. didn't make sense. Yeah. Nope. That's uh, it's all that has to be weighed. There's no in the same light. I, it would be hypocritical for me to either criticize or support that philosophy without, you know, context being. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I always remember in Iraq, I had a couple of old uh, NCOs approach me because they had a command climate issue in their unit. It was another unit. I was not in that unit at the time. And you know, one of the things, their biggest complaint was here they were in Iraq in a holding area uh, with combat going on right outside the wire. And instead of doing uh, advanced trauma life-saving courses, zeroing their night vision goggles, uh, they were standing out having their uh, canteen cups inspected and the vehicle maintenance records inspected. And, you know, when, when I, when I heard that, you know, I put it right into context. It's, it's, you know, if you're not doing what's going to keep your people in live in combat, you're doing the opposite. You're basically contributing to their potential to not make it. And so, you know, I found that just as serious of an infraction is, uh, you know, is, Bad, just bad tactics and strategy. And you I also want to, to if I could, because you're, you keep using this word, Pete, that I absolutely love. And again, I've read your book twice and that all the lessons that you provide, you contextualize them. And I agree with something you said earlier, you know, in that we need these stories so that we can link these neuron pathways in our brain. And we uh, Monday morning show, we had Dusty Solomon on from Building Shooters, and he's written a lot about the neuroscience of, of building great shooters. So the folks got a good lesson on that. But the emphasis on context being so important, 
Uh, I want to ask you, sir, would you unpack that? Why is context and overreaching importance for you and for leaders? Yeah, well, it's a great question, Rich. And, and there's a, a pretty elementary biologic answer to it. Uh, and it has to do with the way our brain works. And, uh, you know, sometimes we talk about the brain, everyone kind of recoils. Oh, boy, you know, this could be too complicated. On the one hand, you're correct. The most complex system found to date in the universe is the human brain. So nothing, nothing in the universe is more complex than the human brain that we have found thus far. Um, so on that side, you're correct. But then on the other, the human brain can be understood in very, you know, basic uh, biologic, uh, by very, very biologic terms. And the best way is what's called the triune brain metaphor, the best way in my opinion, uh, because it's, it's scientifically verified, yet it just is a simplified way to understand uh, the human brain, and that is through its evolutionary origin. Um, we actually, we don't actually have one brain, we actually have three brains. Um, and you know, the, the model I use, uh, if this is the brain, uh, this is the neocortex on top, the thinking brain, that wrinkly thing, the emotional brains in the middle, and then the brain stem, our reptilian brains on the bottom. This thing would be the spinal cord where all of our sensory nerves are feeding up into the brain at. So the importance of the model, of showing this model, is as the only way a human can make sense is through our senses. Uh, we all make sense the same way. We all share a 99.5% the same DNA-enabled nervous system, which is why we all have two eyes, two ears, a nose, a mouth, uh, a brain, a spinal cord packaged inside a body wrapped in skin. Uh, evolution won't let us make sense any other way. It's what makes us a species. Uh, why is that important? Because it's a common ground you know, we can actually, we actually can make sense of things. And in today's world where basically nothing, we're told nothing makes sense, uh, this gives us a, a platform to pivot off of. Because again, it's, we all make sense the same way and we all make choices the same way. So understanding those three parts of the brain and how they interact with each other, it's called metacognition. Uh, it's how overall how the brain works and we we understand how our brain um thinks and make dis makes decisions we can make better decisions and think better thoughts and here's the way it works so going back again to that that brain thing the sensory information comes up through the spinal cord the first part of the brain it hits is our reptilian brain which is aptly named it's the brain we share with reptiles and amphibians from millions of years ago in our evolutionary history. It's in charge of one thing, just to keep you alive. Uh, it's an unconscious brain, so it controls your heart beat, your, heartbeat, your breathing, uh, your thermal regulation, uh, everything that keeps us alive. That's its job. Anything, the only way it reads the world is familiar versus unfamiliar. So when it sees something unfamiliar, it, it's gonna jolt you with fear or angst or any of its other um, set piece reactions to external stimulus. Um, the reptilian brain can't understand language, uh, only, only uh, images, which is why, you know, we react to images much more uh, emotionally than we do to a description of those images. The next brain is the emotional brain, and it's believed that the emotional brain evolved so that our reptilian brain could learn. Uh, and it does that by attaching emotions to our memories. That's an important point, and it's why we need our emotions so badly. To remember and learn from our experiences, we have to feel our experiences. Um, and that has some second and third order effects. The way our brain files what we learn is by that emotional tab. So it's gonna file things that made you afraid together. It's gonna to file things that made you happy together. It's gonna to file things 
that made you angry together. And that has an effect because going back to the way our brain responds, um, our brain, the emotional and reptilian brains cannot monitor sensory information. They just have a one shot reaction and we're stuck with that. So if you think about uh, encountering a bear in the wild, everyone has the same initial reaction. It's, you know, fear, fight, flight, uh, or freeze. Um, that's our reptilian and emotional brains going to work. The problem with them is they now control your brain. You cannot monitor ongoing sensory information because the only part of our brain that can do that is this wrinkly part on top, the, the thinking brain or neocortex. The only part of our brain that can make sense of what's going on around us, sensory information, is our neocortex. So um, you have, in order to make a good decision, you have to have context. But the only way to have context is to engage your neocortex. So back to that bear thing, you know, if you choose to stay in reptilian emotional brain mode, you're stuck in fear, panic, you're frozen, you have no options. Uh, but all you have to do to switch out of that is something so basic, uh, and it's been talked about for thousands of years, to engage your neocortex, all you have to do is either take a couple of long, full, deep breaths, or count to 10. So breathing, the reason that switches the neocortex is because breathing is an unconscious process. Only your neocortex can take control of unconscious processes. So when you control your breathing, you are engaging your neocortex, your thinking brain. Why is that important? Because up till about 20 years ago, everyone, including science, believed that thoughts control behaviors. We now know it's the other way around. Um, you know, uh, a great quote by, um, by Teddy Roosevelt is that, hey, I used to be afraid of uh, grizzly bears, horses, Indians, and gunslingers. And the way I learned to deal with that was to pretend I wasn't afraid. And when I pretended I wasn't afraid, I was no longer afraid. And so even Teddy Roosevelt in 1905 had figured out that you can literally change the way you think and feel by changing your behaviors. And this applies to everything. You know, the only, when we smile, it sends again, neurons to our brain, you, it makes you happy. So if you're, next time you're stressed out on the highway in traffic, adjust the rear view mirror, take a look, force a smile onto your face, leave it there, and you're gonna feel happy. Uh, it, it changes the way you think. So same thing when you're panic or, you know, someone, let's say it's combat and one of your mates, you know, is spitting saliva and he's beside himself, simply putting a hand on his shoulder and saying, hey brother, take a deep breath, man, count to 10. It's okay, now, now tell me again what happened. And I've done that numerous times and every time the person and every time they come back and they thank you for it. Um, and so, you know, in this book, I, I emphasize that point because it's another one of these things where when I learned it, my first reaction was, wow, I wish I had known that in those terms when I was in the military. I wish that was taught to me and my mates when we came in. And that led to, you know, the, the common sense next step, which is I need to do my job to make it known to future first responders uh, so that they are armed with it. And, you know, if you think about how important that is, uh, because you can't make a good decision with your emotions. And the reason is your emotions cannot monitor ongoing sensory information. Only your neocortex can do that. Only your neocortex can create context. There's no context to an emotional decision, which is why politics is mostly emotional and there's no real context to most political statements. They're just emotional trash uh, thrown at an issue. You know, we've interviewed a couple of uh, <clears throat> 
ER doctors and SWAT docs. And that's something that I've heard them say before, Pete, is, you know, before you take the patient's pulse, take your pulse first hmm. and get your breathing under control. And yeah. one of the, one of the metaphors you use about, uh, you know, the bear, I think is in chapter one of the mission of men and me. Now I have not read your new book and I've, I will order it today. And I think it's going to be book two of a three book uh, series. And, uh, but is the idea of getting treed by a chihuahua. Uh, can <laughs> you, I love that story. Cause I have, you know, maybe not been there exactly, but I, I've been, I've let chihuahuas tree me before. Can you sure. talk to that? Pete? Yeah, we all do. And so again, that's, your tree, the first instinctive reaction to any type of stimulus is always emotional, uh, irrelevant, and arbitrary. And so when you understand that, you know you're still going to react with your reptilian and emotional brains. It's still going to happen. Uh, road rage is a good example. You know, road rage is a habit, but everyone uh, who drives occasionally finds themselves just going off on something. But what most of us do is it comes out of our mouths. We catch it. We know it's an irrelevant thing. We're swearing at nothing. You know, our mission is to drive, to get there safely. Um, and road rage is a classic reptilian brain reaction. It's because if you're cut off, your reptilian brain interprets that as someone just invaded your personal space and threatened your survival. So two of the main things the reptilian brain is on the watch for. And what it does is send you into, you know, usually the fight mode because you're in your vehicle. And so you begin this, you know, diatribe, spitting saliva, purple veins popping out of your head unless you catch yourself. And again, that's the, the amazing thing about uh, the neocortex and training your neocortex People ask all the time, hey, what special training do special ops guys do, you know, to make them steely in the face of death, to, you know, ha have no, to be flatliners when everything else around them is burning to the ground. Uh, and it really is the neocortex because you can train your neocortex to be stronger than your reptilian and emotional brains. And in so doing, you change your brain again. You begin to downregulate these instinctive reactions. So I don't, I don't jump. I don't have a heavy fight or flight reaction when startled. I still have a reaction, but it's instantly quelled because I know I got to shift to that thinking brain as quick as possible. My life's on the line. Uh, and that ability, you know, now remember that you're in charge you can do it. Even when you're still feeling fear, that's when you want to breathe. And that's when you want to count. Uh, Thomas Jefferson said, when angry, count to 10. When really angry, count backwards from 100. And so I've, I've, I've been in the backwards from 100 before. And again, they both work. Uh, one of the hallmarks of common sense is whenever you find out the explanation for it, you always go, of course, makes total sense. And uh, and that's the way it is. You know, if you think of all the things we've all had questions about in the past, I never really believed uh, meditation. You know, I, I thought it was, hey, well, of course, you're, the, you know, quiet. And it's But meditation is neocortex. It's training your neocortex. Uh, you know, people who meditate regularly have incredibly strong neocortexes. And that's your thinking brain. So not only can you do a workout program to attain that. But in the moment, uh, no matter how scared you are, no matter how angry you are. And, and remember, it's not just fear. Anger is a negative emotion. You know, anger is meant has a has a biologic purpose, and that's to allow us to get through barriers that we cannot otherwise get through. So caught in a spider web or something, uh, you got to get angry to get that power. But otherwise, it's a negative emotion. Because when we feel or feel fear, our brain won't let us think or feel uh, memories of past successes and false alarms, which taught us that there's no reason to be angry, that, you know, this is not something to get angry about. So, you know, again, understanding the way the brain thinks and makes decisions allows us 
to make better decisions and think better thoughts. And we always have to remind ourselves, you control your mind, not the other way around. When you allow it to happen the other way around, you're mindless. Yeah, I love it. John says, love the love to explore brain science. And Brett asks, uh, just finished Alone at Dawn. Of course, we had uh, Dan Schilling on the show before. And he, I believe he talks about you a few times in his book. Uh, but in Alone at Dawn, Medal of Honor recipient, John Chapman's side of Tucker Gar, where he writes, Seven Americans Die Due to Classic Examples of Senior Military Incompetence. If you agree, how do we or did we address this problems with our bosses? I don't see the common sense in that instance. Yeah, well, I, I guess I'd start with, you know, I was the commander of that. And so I definitely learned from it. It was, a, you know, a defining moment for me. Uh, you know, you've heard in my first book, it, it's probably the greatest example of always listen to the guys on the ground. Uh, if you don't, people are going to die. Uh, but it's also an example back to, you know, you, you brought up context and how important it is to making especially life or death survival choices. Uh, so, you know, you got guys shooting at you, you got mortars and you've got guys bleeding to death. Uh, so you have all kinds of chaos going on. Um, I'm at the base of the mountain. I've been commanding this thing for four days. You know, the the first instinctive reaction of most leaders is to, you know, tell them something to do. And I had already learned and, you know, from my experience in that valley and from the men who were surrounding it, uh, a, another key lesson. And that's that, you know, the radio is not for command and control. That happens to be a one of its, you know, benefits, a small benefit. That radio is for sharing information, and everyone who has that radio has an equal voice on that on that radio to share information. And in fact, they have a responsibility to share it. Um, I'll talk about, you know, what an amazing tool saying it out loud is uh, for pressure testing what we perceive, but. That's another perfect example of it by saying out loud what we see and sharing it with others. We not we enable multiple brains to pressure test the sense we make to figure out what parts of it are accurate and what parts aren't and to build off that knowledge to make better decisions in the future. And so, you know, in that case, when I was talking to those guys up there, my constant refrain to them is what's your recommendation, right? I was not telling them, you know, I couldn't see that mountain. I couldn't, I wasn't freezing my ass off. Like they were, uh, bullets weren't, you know, flinging over my head. I was still down. I was at the base of the mountain. We still had active enemy, but my context was completely different from their context. And so, you know, understanding that and being consciously aware of it, it's not just important, for your own decisions, but as a leader, how you enable other people to make uh, their own decisions. And I'll just add a little context to this and Pete, correct me if I'm wrong. So you're the AFO commander, if I remember correctly, right? Mm -hmm. Advanced forces operations. And you've been, you're prepping the battle space. You're developing the situation as you would probably term it, trying to understand what we're doing here. And there was a, I don't remember if it was a general or someone out there were Bagram or where they were at. They really wanted to get some NSW teams into the fight to prepare you guys to do something else, which I still wasn't sure what he was, what the plan was from reading the book twice. But um, was that, was that general or commander, whoever that was that, that led to the disaster was, was anyone ever held accountable for those deaths? Um, no, no, all the, you know, without saying any names, all the generals involved got promoted uh, after that. And, you know, I, I don't think any, there was ever any uh, pushback. And, you know, in part, look, I, you know, I'm a realist. I think logic, when you're a logic based person, you're also a realist. And, uh, you know, over time, like what I've learned is the most important thing about these 
about military history and learning from our experiences is that we pass it on. Um, one of the problems with passing it on is the way that military, uh, you know, service members are told to pass things on, which is up your chain of command uh, and then to the unit historian. Well, you know, that's why lessons learned, nobody ever goes, wow, I got to go get the lessons learned from Operation Anaconda or whatever. No one ever says that because we don't really trust the lessons learned in there. They're not, they're always watered down uh, in order to protect, uh, you know, the highest ranking people. And look, I, you know, I, I'm a, I was an officer too. So I'm, I'm just being a realist and saying that's, that's the way it is. Um, and so I never, even while it was happening, I could tell nothing was going to come of that. But I, I also vowed to all those men that died that I would not sit on my hands. I would not, that their what they learned up there, what they taught us would not, uh, would not fall victim to the dustbin of history, that it would be passed on so that future first responders, uh, you know, 10, 20, 50 years from now could come back from a night op and say, wow, you know, those guys saved my life tonight. Uh, I really, I, I read about and learned what happened up on that mountain and it saved my life. And, and so to me, that's what it's about. And I don't, you know, I've taken myself out, maybe the emotion of it, you're just not going to get a uh, adjudication of of uh, responsibility in a lot of these incidents. Well, and I will tell you, you know, I, I think I told you in the email, Pete, uh, I was a pretty senior chief warrant officer when this came out hmm. a couple of years before I retired. And a bunch of us guys in my unit were a bunch of us officers in the unit were reading it and really enjoyed it. And one of the things you talk about and, and you just spoke of about is the the reality and creating a shared reality. Mm -hmm. um, when in that environment, you talked about the radio, not just being a command and control feature, but but it also a way we can share reality. But I would ask you this, it's kind of a silly question perhaps, but how do you create that shared reality when obviously you can choke the net quick? I mean, I, in my own experience in combat, we're jumping onto conduct of fire nets because attack one is, is choked up. I mean, have you? I'm sure you've seen that at some point. Yeah, and again, uh, you know, context is everything. Training, you know, no substitute for a prepared mind. Uh, I've led, you know, regular light infantry units and ranger units and special ops units. And uh, just like I said, in the corporate, you know, you find people are people. It's pretty much the same way across the spectrum of different military units and services. Uh, people are people. and But you know, the culture matters, what they learn ahead of time. It's a leader's job to prime their people's minds. I talk about priming in this new book. Uh, it's, yeah. uh, it's a simple technique. Um, top of mind is why you prime. And uh, it's, again, one of those common sense things. As soon as you hear it, you go, of course. Why? Because our parents were priming us from the time we could talk. You know, when you headed out to school, they told you, look both ways before you cross the street, never talk to strangers, and if you get lost, stay where you're at. They were priming our minds with the three most likely contingencies. So I say that because when you understand how important that radio is ahead of time, it goes a long way to explain to your people, look, guys, uh, if you're talking on that radio and you're not in contact, then you may be interrupting or preventing someone who's in contact with the enemy from not only passing that information to save them, but they might be saving you. They might be going, hey, there's an enemy sneaking up behind you and you're babbling away on the radio. So, you know, talking about that word ahead of time is important. And what I found, you know, based on that lesson is every time I said it, people were like, wow, because most people it's just etched in their head. That radio is the commander's radio. He issues it to give orders, uh, to get sit reps, you know, to get reports. It's this, you know, one way controlled by one person thing. And, and the simple 
you know, it's as simple as just changing the way we think about radios, where we could change the way we think about combat and the decisions we make in combat. Um, and again, you know, uh, that those days in the Shai Code Valley were full of examples of that. Um, one guy would report, you know, he sees enemies scurrying up the side of uh, Takurgar, where uh, the famous battle in the end happened. Another guy would say, yeah, he, he, we've seen him. He goes up and down. That's the courier. He's, he's bringing ammo, supplies up and down. He goes about every 10 minutes. So the other guy, okay, every 10 minutes, maybe we can time it. And when he comes back again, you know, either go direct fire or, or uh, indirect and take him out. So you're learning to adapt. Uh, you know, ad adapting is, is defined as a change in behavior. And that's what our choices are. They're adaptations. We're changing our behavior. But while you're in combat, everything's about learning and understanding what's going on around you because you can't make sensible choices unless you make sense first. And uh, the only way to make sense is with the thinking brain. So same thing, applying it to the radio. Whenever you hear someone spitting saliva through a radio handset, you can just take a deep breath yourself because that person's unhinged. And if you're a leader and you ever catch yourself spitting saliva on the radio, you need to check yourself right away and downregulate that emotion because you're just spewing senselessness and you're ignoring what's going on around you while you're doing it. Yeah, well said, sir. Absolutely well said. You mentioned priming a moment ago, and I, I, I want to ask you a question, Pete. Priming, you know, uh, recognition, prime decision making. Um, ha as someone who still travels the country and trains law enforcement teams, recently had an incident. I've discussed it on the show many times before, but it was a gross misunderstanding of recognition, prime decision making. Hmm. They were training these officers to to shoot a turning target. Well, the turning target, when it turned toward you, the the target had his hand open was completely unarmed and uh, and they were trying to tell me that oh this is the latest science rich see this is called recognition prime decision making <laughs> i'm like okay so the what you prime this officer to do is when subject turns and he's completely defenseless you shoot him twice in the chest and assess the threat and uh so i wonder if you could pete talk to the importance of perhaps recognition prime decision making as it helps us make decisions at speed and that's in the relevance of that in the context of combat, please. Yeah, well, I recognition prime decision making, you know, it's its validity is that experience matters, right? So, you know, I think his famous example is of the firefighters going into the kitchen and, uh, you know, there's no sign of flames. There's, you know, no grease fire, uh, but the captain, the senior guy notices something about the floor. I, I can't remember if the um, the rivets were coming out or if it was slightly smoky, but he immediately recognized these are the symptoms of a basement fire. This is what wood does when it's burning up below him. And so he instantly took everyone out of there and the floor collapsed. And, you know, it, it proved that the recognition prime decision making model. Um, my thing always, even then, you know, even when I first read it, which I was in the military when I first read about it, um, it's it, it. My response is, it can only go so far. Uh, you know, you're you're priming people to uh, recognize something a little quicker, and as much as you're priming them to recognize it, you're also arming them with whatever the key guiding principles are that you know your specific profession or endeavor uh you know depends on to succeed uh in any situation so you know giving those those guiding principles is not like a decision making uh um straight jacket because what's missing is the adaptive stimulus of the context of the moment and my thing is uh Prime your brain with knowledge, as much knowledge as you can get that's context specific to whatever you're doing. Then go out and pay attention to what's going on around you. Don't start thinking about, you know, all these principles and lessons. 
Pay attention to what's going on around you. Um, and remember what I said about the neocortex. The only part of our brain that can pay attention is our neocortex. The neocortex is the part of our brain that receives sensory information and makes sense of it. So um, by cueing our neocortex, you're enabling your brain to begin building context around what it needs to do next. And, and you're never going to know what that is, right? Because that floor, that fire could have moved up into the, in through the walls to the ceiling. Uh, and if he wasn't paying attention to that too, he could have backed out of the kitchen and had the ceiling fall down on him. Uh, so, you know, focusing your, your senses, um, and that brings up another, uh, you know, lesson that I pass on in, in my new book, The Common Sense Way. It taught to me by one of the finest sniper recce uh, operators that I ever had the pleasure to work with. And it's about paying attention. And what he taught me, uh, and he taught me in Bosnia while we were trying to capture a uh, war criminal who often used disguises, and we were surveilling a crowd that he walked through in the town square and the lesson was if you really want to pay attention and it goes back to this actions control thoughts and behaviors then focus like a cat staring for a mouse in a field and if you just think about that image of a cat ears perked up eyes laser uh fixed on what it's looking at stock still you know, muscles ready to pounce. That's how a cat pays attention. And when we do the same thing, you can try at any time, you'll find yourself suddenly experiencing this multi-sensory world that you're not getting any other way. Why is it, why, how can you apply that practically? Well, you know, you just mentioned shooting. And one of the things that always amazes me about shooters, so if you watch the great shooters and, uh, you know, you, you hang out, talk to, or you're probably one yourself. It's important to watch them shoot. And as much as they shoot, the guys who do training all the time, every shot looks the same. If you watch them, they, when they are staring at that front sight post, they look like a cat looking for a mouse in the field. They are 100% attentively focused on that front sight post. And, you know, I applied this myself. I, I don't shoot as much as I used to. So when I do, you know, I want to make it count. Uh, obviously bullets or, you know, uh, you can't fling steel like you used to anymore. So you got to make every shot count. And so, you know, while writing this book, uh, I said, hey, I'm going to put it in practice on shooting now. And sure enough, every time I shot like that, you know, my results, you know, target groups like that and just ability to hit long range where, you know, Otherwise, I'm just hoping to be lucky. So believe in and trust your senses. Remember the, the cat metaphor. It's your mo one of your most important behavioral uh, tools. And when you really need it, whether it's the Sierra hitting the fan or you're trying to make a great shot at the range or a great golf shot on the golf course, think of that cat metaphor, apply it, and then feel what happens when you're 100% neocortex engaged, paying attention to what's going on around you. I, I like your uh, this discussion of context and recognition of problem decision making in that we don't want to pigeonhole the thinking, right? We want to have, we want to have our aperture open to possibilities and not and not and and not close it down. And one of the things you started the conversation with Pete is. Uh, the cultural context as well. For example, you know, as a kid, my grandfather was a produce seller and we would travel the Eastern seaboard selling produce and buying produce. So mm -hmm. as I have traveled the world, you know, in the military and as a civilian, looking at how markets perform and there, there's a lot of similarities, but there's a few cultural differences in, in that. And I, I, I'm saying all this to say, like if you look at the bad acronym, you know, you have a baseline, cultural baseline, w w which you're operating under, and that shifts culturally as you move through the country and around the world. And then you have that anomalous behavior. And then when we see that, we have to make a decision, right? And the decision could be we're going to cancel 
uh, we're going to change the plan or we're going to continue even though we have an anomaly. So I think understanding the, the context of the situation, the cultural landscape that you're, or the terrain that you're operating in can help us with awareness. Am I making too much of that? Uh, no, I think, um, you know, I, I think that culture is, you know, the probably the biggest influence right behind instincts on us. So, you know, going back to what I said about leadership climates, uh, you know, you need to see what good looks like to be good. Uh, and, you know, again, back to shooting, uh, it's only by bringing in shooters that you realize what the art of the possible is. Right. Uh, you never would have thought, you know, that a trigger can be pulled three times in, you know, whatever fraction of a second it can be pulled at unless you see someone do it. And then, you know, you mimic them. That's, that's the mirror neurons in our brains. That's how we learn. We, you don't have to be the first or the fastest. You only need to recognize a pattern is advantageous, then mimic it and put it into practice uh, as quickly as possible. And, you know, I think when you're talking about decisions, it's okay to make, you know, every decision is not going to work out, no matter how much information you have. Uh, that's nature. There's no straight lines in nature. There's no perfection in nature. Uh, that's how nature works. There's an anomaly for everything. Um, so the most important thing for making decisions and solving problems is that you consciously understand the logic of why you made the decision, uh, the logic of why you went in the direction you went in. Uh, when you don't understand that and it goes awry, you, you can't, you vacillate between guilt and just blowing it off. Ah, you know, it, Sierra happens. But when you understand why you made the decision, even when it doesn't turn out so well, you can actually learn from it and you can pivot from it so that you won't make the same mistake or you'll make a better decision the next time you do it. But the logic of why is incredibly important. Uh, it's one of the concepts, the language of common sense that I teach. And again, it's not something I made up. It's the way our neocortex uh, thinks and makes decisions. Um, you know, everything works in threes, uh, including our DNA. And, you know, to convince our brains that something makes sense, our brains need three supporting patterns. Uh, firstly, secondly, and thirdly, that's where those come from. Uh, the tripod is the strongest, most self-supporting pattern in nature. Uh, you have to have three legs to stand on or you're not standing on solid ground. Um, and again, I learned that, um, you know, while flying over Afghanistan in an AC-130 and trying to convince someone that a, a target that was called in as a busload of terrorists wasn't and that there were no guns on it, no flags. It wasn't shooting any guns. So how can we call it a busload of terrorists and be, you know, pounding it with 105 shells when we don't even know that it's an enemy bus? So, you know, to convince the crew to back off and to convince the people controlling the uh, bombardment, I had to come up with three uh, patterns that proved that they were, that it was an enemy and that it was civilian. So understanding that ahead of time, being able to package it uh, is hugely important because persuasion is really the epicenter of both business and combat. You gotta be able to persuade uh, your people, the people to your left and right and the person or people above you. Uh, and if you can't persuade them, uh, again, as a leader, you're not, doing your job. Yeah, totally, totally agree with that. I want to ask you also your your new company, Pete, Ad Armor. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's so, you know, you you kind of hit on our uh, tagline. The idea behind adding armor is to create a mobile safe room that protects the vehicle's passengers against uh, would-be attackers. Think criminals, uh, terrorists, active shooters, and anarchists. Uh, while also providing the owner with peace of mind that cannot be attained in an unarmored vehicle. 
And that's an important part and a part of the concept, the idea for the concept. Uh, you know, again, I can't pinpoint a single event that, you know, made me think I, I need to start an armor company. It was a lot of events and uh, certainly those riots that were happening. And, you know, we, we can't even uh, pinpoint dates anymore because they went on so long. These ones were happening, I think, in 2017. And there was one that happened in Portland, uh, soon to be burnt down Portland. Uh, and I watched it on TV and I just could not believe that these punks were stopping traffic, um, running up, pounding on these cars, uh, damaging the cars. Uh, and on the one particular uh, vignette that was showed, they broke the window, uh, pulled the guy out of the car. He was probably 70 some odd years old and they they pulled him out because he had North Carolina plates. And uh, so they could, he was saying, Hey, I'm just driving through it. You know, I'm not, I'm not doing anything. He, he was, you know, begging for to be left alone. Uh, and the camera panned over to the right. And there was a, a policeman on a motorcycle sitting on the sidewalk. And, you know, that policeman probably wanted to respond, but as we would learn, you know, what, two years later, uh, municipally, he was not allowed to respond. He was told to stand down like so many of uh, these amazing first responders are. And, you know, we can wring our hands about that. We can complain all we want, but it doesn't change reality. Uh, you know, back to that concept of reality, reality is what we adapt to. Uh, and you either adapt or you perish. And 99.99 infinity of all species that have ever walked this planet are have gone extinct. So we don't need a reminder for how tenuous our existence is. You have to adapt. And the adaptation is, it's not like it used to be, folks. You can't get someone to back off by going, hey, one more step, I'm calling the cops. Uh, because people know they can't make it in time. There's not enough of them. They, in many cases, they're not allowed. So to me, that drove home, you know, that we're so vulnerable in our cars. And, and almost at the same time, I was sitting at a stoplight uh, in a medium-sized city in America. And I was behind. I was packed into traffic. And a couple of bums came out. And, you know, they were panhandling. You know, I, I, back to that down regulation thing. I didn't have I, I didn't have a fear, but as they came over right around my car, I know what was happening to me. The same thing I described to you with the reptilian brain in road rage. They were invading my space and making it even worse when you're in those parked situations. You're trapped. So another thing our our reptilian brain alerts us to is if you're trapped. That's why being in a box. Claustrophobia is a real instinctive reaction. It's not, it can be a sickness when it goes, but everyone's claustrophobic. That's how we survive. You are not supposed to be okay with having your hands and feet tied and being put in a box. Uh, that is not okay. That's where a big part of our instincts, our freedom of choice, why it's so um, ten, why it's so important to the makeup of of who we are and how we act. Um, but, you know, I felt that and I could imagine how, uh, you know, someone less or more vulnerable would feel in the same circumstance. So those things together uh, sent me off to do research. You know, I had done a massive project in the military on uh, armoring civilian vehicles for Afghanistan. So I knew a, a decent amount about armor. I've been driving around in them for the past five years. Um, and so I, I dove back into the technology, found that, you know, there's cutting edge technology out there that kind of changes the game and weight. Um, we looked at new ways to armor vehicles. You know, when you think of an armored vehicle, you think of an armored cocoon. And uh, I tell people that's what you drive around in in a combat zone. It's a ballistic cocoon that will protect you, whether it's an IED, a sniper up on a hill or you know an attack from the side so you have to be have a ballistic cocoon in combat you do not have to have that in north america 
Uh, your chance of driving over an IED are much lower than getting hit by lightning. So you don't need your floor armored. You really don't need your ceiling armored, uh, especially if it's an SUV uh, height wise. And on top of that, armoring a ceiling make, uh, makes a vehicle top heavy. So if you get down to what needs to be protected, uh, we came up with a package called the Anti-Intrusion Protection Package, and it simply replaces all the vehicles factory installed glass, safety glass with ballistic glass. And then we insert lightweight composite panels in all the doors and the back hatches. Um, so we can take an SUV, let's say a Tahoe and do our anti-intrusion protection package uh, and only add about 425 pounds to the vehicle, which is you know not wow. even an and a half and uh, would do it for under $30,000. So, you know, by looking at all that, looking at the context of the moment, um, looking at competition, it just made sense to me. And, um, you know, again, I wanted to put my money where my mouth is. Um, I've always aspired to start and run my own company. And I always aspired to run a company the common sense way. So this kind of was a threefer for me, um, you know, getting, getting uh, something meaningful to do, starting something new and running the company uh, the common sense way. Yeah, I'm going to have to get my F-150 out there to you, Pete. We do a lot of pickup trucks. The Raptors, a lot of, uh, especially 150s, Raptors, and uh, certainly a lot, of, uh, a lot of Chevys too. So I want to switch back to your time in uniform and, and kind of look into a crystal ball a little bit. Where do you see the future of warfare going, Pete, and maybe the future of your old unit? It, do you see more manhunting being the emphasis as we move forward into the 21st century or less or something else? Yeah, I think, you know, the watchword is uh, flexibility and adaptability. And, um, you know, again, retrospect is one of the great teachers. And uh, this this retrospective you know, insight comes from a lot of the senior non-commissioned officers I was fortunate enough to work with. And, you know, they're, they, they have a, this amazing sense of history that always just uh, blows me away and, and contextualizing history. And one of the things, you know, that, that they brought up to me was if you think about our unit in the military in general prior to 911, we really didn't train for Afghanistan or train specifically for Iraq. But as far as the unit goes, we trained based on common sense. So, you know, you, you've read my book about going to the Bob Marshall Wilderness. You know, no one had ever gone to the Bob Marshall Wilderness before. It wasn't just my idea. It was my, my guy's ideas. And it wasn't just a Let's go backpack. It was because when we looked at the world, when we did uh, 1998, 99, um, and we looked at the key threat areas around the world, we saw uh, the Andes between Colombia and Peru. We saw the Hindu Kush uh, between Afghanistan and, uh, and, and Pakistan and, and all the stands up north. Um, and we saw the Balkans, which we were already in at the time. And one of the things, the common denominator was the mountains. And when we thought about it, we were like, yeah, we do winter training, we do jungle training, we do desert training, we do urban training, but we really don't train in the mountains. And uh, believe it or not, it was not a unanimous thing. A lot of people thought, yeah, you know, what a waste of time. You're just going to go hike in the mountains. But we, you know, we had the context of why we came up with it. And each, I had three guys, they each did uh, an assessment of the worldwide intel situation. And at the end of their assessment, it was just a short presentation. They talked about how they would adapt to uh, better prepare us for that contingency. And, you know, the, the going into the mountains was the unanimous part. And it wasn't just because there are mountains in there, those areas, it was because of the privation training that goes along with it. 
um, of the physical ardor that goes along with it and of just the re-emphasis at a PhD level of how to read terrain and how to use terrain to your advantage and to give you an advantage over an unsuspecting enemy. So all those things together. Um, and then the icing on the cake was the Bob Marshall has grizzly bears. So, you know, having something that can kill you or that can potentially attack you at any time, it sounds kind of funny saying it, but it's very helpful because, you know, camp, camp discipline, for instance, uh, you're more camp, you're more disciplined in a wilderness camp in Montana, uh, or Idaho than, you know, a lot of people are in the jungle or in some combat scenario. Uh, you know, you're raising your food every night. You're not getting any food on your clothes. Uh, you're washing your utensils off. You're hanging that food a hundred meters away from your campsite at nighttime. Um, you know, you are constantly prepared to run into a grizzly bear and to take action. And so all that together helped. And so the reason I give that example is, you know, I would continue to uh, adapt. I, I My training focus would be continue to adapt. I, I think one thing we can definitely uh, not just experiment with, but take to a next level is, uh, to, to really focus more on small teams and the potential for teams instead of companies, battalions and brigades. They're just not, you know, it, it's such an, a uh, mismatch. And it, all you have to say is, you know, they ask the question, why are we still using the same approach to warfare that we used in World War I to fight Al Qaeda? Um, you know, again, you read my first book and one of the things that bugged me about Vietnam was just that, right. you know, anyone knows in the jungle, you put 40 guys in a column, it's like, you really only have one guy, the guy on point, and then 39 guys, you don't really know what's going on in front of them. And you have chaos. They can't maneuver together. They can't understand, you know, what's going on around them together. You take a smaller group, you know, it's easier to communicate. They can uh, attack, defend, or pull back, you know, in a very nimble fashion. Uh, but I think, you know, small also prevents you from making the, you know, the deadly spiral of putting too many people on the ground. And it really does become uh, a math equation uh, it, at its very essence. If you look at uh, the history of Afghanistan from 2001 uh, through, say, 2010, you'll see this perfectly parallel uh, two lines. One is the number of deaths in Afghanistan. The other is the number of troops. They just match each other all the way. And if you go back and realize that, you know, we threw the Taliban government out and all of its foreign fighter allies with less than 500 special mission unit men. And we knew our biggest advantage was how nimble we were and that we weren't providing a target for the enemy. Uh, so, you know, I would say as far as trends, uh, experiment and continue pushing towards smaller, uh, more flexible approaches to combat, um, but stay ultimately flexible, keep letting, you know, the guys who are in at the time assess the worldwide situation, uh, do not get stuck in our ways that we got to keep doing one kind of training every year, the same amount, uh, be flexible and continually adapt our military uh, to not just, you know, potential threats, but to the threats that are present at the time uh, that you're doing the training and the preparing. Yeah, well said. <clears throat> Greg says this session is a gold mine. Thanks, Pete. And Rich, ordering Pete's books now. <clears throat> Watching with my cortex fully engaged. <clears throat> Go, man. Alan says, hate to go. My wife and I are going out to eat. We'll watch a replay for what I missed. Great show. Tremendous info. Hmm. And if you haven't read Pete's book, you know, one of the tasks that that you and uh, several operators are tasked to put together, one of them's a nudist. And shout out to him. He knows who he is. Uh, 
I had dinner with Rob Latham a couple months ago out in uh, Arizona. We were talking about that fellow Great. nudist there. <laughs> yep, he knows him well. Yeah, he does. But uh, anyway, <laughs> one of the things that uh, I wanted to talk to you about, Pete, was this idea that, uh, you know, listening. And, and to your point about the, the group that you were tasked to put together to go after this guy named Osama bin Laden before he really jumped on and became a household name was a pretty interesting story. And maybe a lot of people don't know that about you, that you guys were really leaning forward into that guy long before he did the events of 9-11. Yeah, definitely. And uh, huge, huge impact uh, on us. You know, that was 1998. Um, and, you know, we were tasked. So it, it comes back to your question about how, you know, future warriors should train, uh, how they should approach uh, combat, how they should organize, how they should uh, uh, adjust their tactics. Um, and it comes back to our biology again. And, you know, when in doubt, develop the situation. Again, this is not just some nifty little principle that sounds good. It's the biologic way our nervous system, which includes our brain, is hardwired to make decisions and solve problems. Uh, and, you know, sometimes abbreviated is learn, adapt, and interact. Uh, these three guiding principles were taught to us uh, by senior unit members, as I mentioned before, continually referenced as part of our common language and continually reinforced uh, by feedback from real world missions. And, and over time, we just began, instead of saying learn, adapt, and interact, we began just saying develop the situation. Uh, it's the common sense way, as I mentioned, that our brains are hardwired to deal with complexity. And it, it, everything is in the definition. Develop simply means to bring out the possibility or potential of something. Situation is what's going on around us in the context of moment. As a method, Developing the situation means to bring out the possibility and potential of what's going on around us in the context of the moment. As a mindset, we bring out the possibility and potential of something when we take time to think about it. So remember that you are not going to solve a problem by just walking around and hoping an answer comes to your head. You have to engage your neocortex and think about it. And once you do and you combine it with time, you'll see what your neocortex does for you. It builds context. That's the amazing thing about our neocortex. It's also creative. It can take old context and kind of reform it or reshape it. Um, so that was when I first got on the ground, those first that winter of 2001, 2002, um, you know, we had totally outrun the Pentagon's time phase plan, and we had broken off connectivity with our out of country chains of command. So, uh, you know, there we were on the ground, less than 500 members of special mission units from all different services, agencies, and in some cases, different countries. Uh, and we were in Afghanistan, it's the winter of 2001, 2002, and we have no guidance for what we're supposed to do next or how we're supposed to organize. And, you know, that's where this concept of developing the situation, which we had already taken uh, and, and practiced and uh, gained confidence in from operations in Bosnia, that's where it really came out. We knew that whenever you're dealing with a situation and you have no answer for what to do, just do what your instincts tell you, which is develop the situation, learn from, adapt to, and interact with what's going on around you. And in 1998, uh, I was given the mission to plan for an operation to go up the chain all the way to the president to capture UBL. That was the first time I ever saw UBL, first time I ever heard of him. And, uh, you know, I did what we always did when we got a new mission. I grabbed uh, four or five uh, key planners that were available, uh, operators, intel guys, uh, language experts, 
and we went down into one of the uh, into the isolation facility and just started brainstorming what to do next. Uh, you know, the concept we came up with was that we sent up higher was called the Lewis and Clark uh, concept. Mm -hmm. And so the inspiration for us to explain developing the situation uh, comes from Lewis and Clark and the core of discovery uh, as they were called by President Jefferson in 1803. And the purpose of the core of discovery, everything's about that purpose, uh, was to survey the unexplored western half of the U.S. from the Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and just to you know, remind everyone, that expedition lasted over two years. Uh, so the mission they were on took two years. Along the way, they encountered harsh weather, unforgiving terrain, treacherous waters, uh, injuries, starvation, disease, uh, both friendly and hostile Native Americans. And through it all, uh, through the approximately 8,000 mile round trip journey, uh, it was just a huge success. They only lost one guy to appendicitis and that was early all the way back right after they left St. Louis. Uh, and they discovered all this new information, new geographic, ecological and social knowledge. Um, so the core of discovery provides probably the best metaphor for any team that's dealing with complex decision-making and problem solving. Uh, and all you gotta do is compare them to a modern day team. They didn't have any detailed maps. They didn't have plans. They didn't have satellite connectivity to a distant chain of command. All they had to make decisions and solve problems uh, was the, their biologic instincts and the knowledge they had in their head. The, the core of discovery didn't plan, they prepared. They used their planning time to prepare. Plan is a verb, not a noun. Plan is how we prepare. One of the things that's happened to plan, uh, and you know, the military certainly has a large part in this, is we've turned plan into a noun. We've turned it into a thing. And that's why people take it as such a rigid uh, you know, system of fence posts that you cannot go outside of in your attempt to accomplish your purpose. And, you know, leaders make that even worse by emphasizing, you know, it as an order. But that's not what a plan is. Planning is how we prepare. And, you know, we prepare to develop the situation. But we do that by arming ourselves with knowledge, all the context specific knowledge that we can learn about what we're about to do. And that goes back to that priming uh, piece we talked about. So just to, to summarize, developing the situation is bringing out the possibility and potential by learning from, adapting to, and interacting with what's going on around us. It's a, it's a group method and it's an individual method. And, you know, anyone who's ever worked on any type of problem, whether simple or complex, uh, has experienced the nonlinearity of this instinctive process. Uh, just think about it. When the lights go out in your house at night, uh, we don't light a candle so we can come up with a 10 step plan for what to do next. Instead, we follow our instincts. We immediately begin learning from, adapting to, and interacting with what's going on around us. We try the lights in different rooms and see uh, it, you know, to see if they work. And when they don't, we adapt and we look outside. Uh, and when we look outside, we're looking to see if other houses in our neighborhood have lights. When we see they do, we adapt again and we head down into our basement or our garage to check the fuse box and check the circuit breakers. Um, the more complex the problem, the more we need to learn from, adapt to, and interact with it to have any hope of coming up with the solution. So developing the situation is what we did. That's why we were successful. We weren't following a plan. We were developing the situation and getting smarter because of it. When you develop the situation, you're not trying to predict the future. You're trying to understand and interact with the present so that you can shape the future via the choices you make and influence it to accomplish your purpose. Uh, so, you know, as a, as a decision-making problem-solving method um, and as an organizational method, you know, I don't, it's, 
it is the way to go, the common sense way to deal with complexity. Uh, and it works in business, it works at home. And again, like all, everything else that's common sense, all you have to do is think through that lights out in the house uh, scenario and you understand that developing the situation is instinctive and the common sense approach to dealing with complexity. Excellent answer. And in and, and your book, you give several vignettes about this that are uh, outstanding, like listen to the guy on the ground and the guy saying, if you're going to go over the Bob Marshall at this time, you're going to need to have snowshoes. It was an outstanding uh, point. Or the, the young, attractive uh, park ranger who causes you guys to alter your plan and, you know, setting that, you know, alpha males, man, we got egos and we have to set those egos aside sometimes and listen to the person on the ground who has the best and most accurate information. So I loved those stories in the book. Spot on. Yeah. You got to teach yourself that. So again, that's about that down regulating. You can down regulate ego. So mm -hmm. when every time we catch ourselves, you know, making an egotistical, whether it's a thought or about to make a choice or, you know, influence a behavior. If you catch that and, you know, say it out loud, either to yourself or to others, uh, you can expose that emotion for its senselessness. It, you know, ego is an irrelevant emotion. It just does not have any, it can't be based on what's going on around you in the context of the moment. And you're right. It's like a, you know, a bad leg that we have to compensate for all the time. Uh, so knowing it, being consciously aware of it, saying it out loud to yourself and, you know, practicing it. Uh, you know, what I didn't say in that story was uh, uh, one of the guys, you know, was beside himself uh, that we listened to, you know, this uh, female park ranger. And, you know, it was really an insightful moment for the rest of us in the team because, you know, as he was just babbling away on the trail, we were just sitting there going, man, I never even thought of it as, you know, I mean, she's a park ranger. Like, how could you, how could you uh, not accept that? And she, she's living in this cabin at the edge of the mountain. Like, how could you not accept that as foundational? And, and also, you know, you need emotions to quell emotions. So there's the emotion you can translate any way you want, fear, embarrassment, or failure. Uh, and, you know, embarrassment is a hugely powerful emotion, often unrecognized. Um, you know, emotion, uh, embarrassment uh, makes us learn from our experiences, even when no one else knows what happened. So, you know, we can be embarrassed over a mistake that only we know about. Uh, and that embarrassment is like real feedback telling us we did something wrong. You can tell our biology is it's a very important part of our biology because when most people get embarrassed, they turn red. And that is a real human response. And it's not arbitrary. It's meant to show other people around us that we recognize that we made a mistake and that we're showing contrition for it. And if you think of, you know, if you think about that in terms of a, a child who's embarrassed, it, that's exactly, you know, we see emotions in their real form better in children than we do in adults because we've already rewired a lot of our emotions in different ways, but children are usually very pure and, you know, embarrassment, uh, you can see that in children, but you can just reflect on your own life. And I know for me, uh, embarrassment is as big of a motivator as any other emotion in my life. Uh, it's, you know, it makes me work harder, work out harder, study harder, prepare more because I don't want to be embarrassed. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, again, back to the neocortex, the only you know, people ask, what's emotional intelligence? Emotional intelligence is your ability to make sense of your emotions. And, you know, our brain is set up that way so your neocortex can make sense of your emotions. Our emotions are not arbitrarily negative. They're all made to help us out. So, 
you know, anxiety is not a negative emotion unless you allow it to consume you. Anxiety is your instinctive way that your subconscious brain is telling you, hey, man, you got you got stuff that needs to be addressed that you've been blowing off. And the reason I'm not letting you go to sleep and you're tossing and turning and I'm shooting this anxiety because remember, emotions are neurochemicals released by our brain. The reason I'm doing it is to get you to address this thing that if you don't, you're going to continue to have anxiety for. Guilt is the same way. Uh, you know, guilt is we know we did something that we shouldn't have done and we need to make amends for it. We need to correct it. So, you know, only when we think about guilt with our neocortex can we make sense of it. Only when we think of anxiety can we make sense of it. Only when we think about road rage with our neocortex can we make sense of it and at that point you realize the senselessness of it and again that goes back to how we down regulate it and prevent ourselves from doing it again in the future excellent answer sir and greg has a question he asks how does risk and risk assessment play into the process assuming there would be multiple paths forward well you know risk to me is is uh, the unknown. And so there's always risk because there's always unknown. Um, coming back to don't plan, prepare. Uh, that's why, you know, when you're, when you're running a team, again, combat business, uh, prepare them with knowledge. Uh, you know, learn everything you can about the subject matter that you're about to uh, surround yourself in. Um, build that context in your brain and then prepare yourself, you know, back to that metacognition thing, prepare yourself to make those decisions. Remember, uh, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you're not paying attention to the adapted stimulus of what's going on around you, uh, you're, you have zero chance of making a good decision. So um, decision making is an equation and, you know, what we know, plus what's going on around us equals the logic of why we do what we do and choose what we choose. And it has to add up. If it doesn't add up between what we know and what's going on around us, then uh, the equation doesn't work and you get a wrong answer for what you do next. So though, you know, it's a risk to me is, is a constant. It's everywhere you can, uh, you can also down regulate risk by learning. Uh, the more knowledge you have, uh, the more confident you are. You know, I, I mentioned uh, one of the principles AFO used was audacity, 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 be audacious. Uh, but audacity is not taking senseless risks. It's a reflection of your confidence in what you know. Uh, and you can be audacious when you're confident that you know what's going on around you. And does that mean you won't get hit by a random bullet or a random artillery shell? No. Uh, we all know that every time we get in our car, uh, you know, we're risking our lives and we get in our car multiple times every day. Uh, so there's certain things we can't control. Being at one with that is also important. Um, and, you know, it goes back to that thing. Don't don't sit there and worry, learn and accept that what you're going into entails some risk. And, uh, you know, the old adage, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Risk is the spice of life. Uh, if you're not risking it, you know, you're stagnant. And if you're stagnant, you're heading in the wrong direction on evolutionary terms. Yeah. I, one of the things that, you know, that audacity, 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 and I love the AFO concept, uh, I hope the Marine Corps uses some version of that. Uh, it, it's amazing, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it's an informed audacity in that, you know, you guys read the terrain, you guys read books on the subject mm -hmm. so that you can be audacious. It's not just like, well, we just showed up and we're going to be audacious. No, I, I think there's, there's enough, there, there is an informed component to that. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, so again, you know, and you connect that back, we were in the Bob Marshall in 
June of 2001, June, July of 2001. So we were fresh out of the Bob. And, and so when I looked at the, the mountains around Shahi Coat, I saw opportunity. I didn't see a problem. Up to that point, uh, and again, this, this is where preparation, my Vietnam history, you know, was whispering in my ear the whole time. One of the problems in Vietnam was uh, the fire base mentality. Guys would only go out, you know, with a butt pack on or whatever, and they go out on these day patrols and they come back or night patrol and come back to the fire base. And, you know, especially in a guerrilla war, uh, it's just we learned the futility of that technique uh, as it went on. And so when I got to Afghanistan and, and we're talking February, March of 2002, uh, we're beginning to spread out. You know, I was aware that, up to that point, no one had slept outside and no one had, uh, you know, lived off the land in Afghanistan up to that point. No, no American force. And so when I saw those mountains and knew what we just went through, especially this, you know, incredibly simplistic insight, which came from experience that anytime we stood looking up at mountains, uh, we knew that by the end of the day, if we picked our route right, we could be on the other side of that mountain. So that by then going in, we knew we were incredibly physically fit, uh, but we also knew we had better equipment than the Afghans. And even though they're more sensitized to the cold, they did not have good cold weather equipment. They also had no um, advanced way to carry water. They'd have a canteen here, a canteen there, and there's no water in the in the Afghanistan mountains, uh, at least in the the central, the Panjshir uh, Valley area. There there is no running water, and so we knew they had a disadvantage there. Uh, we also knew they were firing every enemy we had come in contact with in those first few months. Fired iron sights, AKs, many of the ones we took off of, uh, captured or killed were not zeroed, uh, rusting. And so we believed we also had a serious advantage marksmanship wise, ordinance wise, ability to reach out and touch targets uh, with weapon systems, and that we could take chances in a firefight, uh, which proved out to be true. Uh, by, by spring, we knew that in a firefight, if we were a couple hundred meters out, we could take uh, a chance we wouldn't normally take from running from cover to cover uh, in order to try to flank someone uh, or to get to a better position. So all that stuff mattered. All of it led to our confidence, our audacity. Um, but, you know, again, unless you talk about it, pass it on, uh, unless everybody feels that audacity, uh, and that goes back to that persuasion thing, you know, you got to make sure your whole team, even though you all know all those things I just said, reviewing them gives you the confidence uh, and makes it centered in everyone's head. Hey, there's no reason to, you know, doubt ourselves here. We got everything going for us. We still, it's still combat. We still respect the enemy. Uh, we still know every one of these missions has a chance of us not coming back, but we've done everything we could to mitigate that and more. And we believe in what we've done over these past 10, 15 years. Uh, and that gave us the courage of our convictions to act. And I, I think all of that's still relevant. Um, you know, the military just needs to make sure that it keeps that kind of capability and keeps that conscious awareness alive for the operators right now. Yes, sir. And I have a couple of questions for you. We've been on here for almost two hours, Pete. Wow. I know. I don't want to be respectful of your time, but I really do have about two more questions. Yeah, no. We, may have, we um, may have to do round two if you're up for it sometime. Yeah. Sure. Uh, one of the questions I have is, what is the, as far as you're concerned, uh, what is the greatest threat to our nation at this point? Hmm. Um, those who want to take freedom away. So I think if maybe we've, you know, we change our perspective of what enemy is uh, based on time and experience. Uh, you know, it was a paradigm shift after 911 that 
this was not a nation state. This was a conglomeration of like-minded people uh, who had various motivations, but all came back to the same thing. Um, and, you know, we had to adjust our thinking to that. We had to adjust on everything from, you know, there's no targets to bomb. Uh, there's no, no fixed objectives that you can go surveil and understand everything about them. Um, but the main thing was, you know, we learned we had to understand that enemy and adapt to them. And, and I've always believed that the common denominator of all enemies around the globe and, and the, the bifurcation of good and evil in the world is between freedom loving people and those who want to take it away. And that's not, again, philosophic, that's biologic. Right. You know, freedom of choice is our most biologically inherent human trait. Uh, and it's a result of our triune brain. Our neocortex provides us with options. When you have two or more options, you have freedom to choose between them. When you only have one option, you have no freedom and you can't make a choice. You're stuck in a single course of action. So when you realize that and the way your reptilian and emotional brain react, single, uh, single option, you're stuck in your neocortex. It's constantly, it's, it's like a live feed, constantly monitoring the situation going on around you, constantly providing your brain with options to adapt to what's going on around you. Uh, so, you know, I think that we have to think differently about enemies. I think that, uh, the threat against freedom is real. We have to stand our ground. Um, I'm, you know, to me, I'm not bummed out about it. I feel like I got reincarnated. I always wanted to be alive in 1775 and 1776 and participate uh, in, you know, the greatest revolution in the history of mankind. Uh, and it's important to go back to that time period because, you know, think about the colonists back then. Um, they were living hard scrabble lives. They didn't have any money. Everything they ate, they had to grow. Um, you know, the threat from Indians and wildlife and, and other Americans was, was constant. Uh, you know, they lived their lives one step probably advanced from our ancient ancestor caveman parents. Uh, and so all that, they had no real incentive. There was no vision of this going to be America, but they knew they came to America to get away from that lack of freedom that's so pervasive in Europe at the time. Europe was uh, completely run uh, by monarchies kings and queens, uh, as well as religious fundamentalists. And so most people had no say in their own destiny. They came to the U.S., they had this little, you know, uh, window of freedom, which became very obvious to them the longer they were here, that they were free. They had a say in their own destiny. They could go down to the saloon and talk about, you know, uh, making their town better so that their kids could grow up with a better life. But they had no, there's no vision, there's no draft, there's no, hey, you know, you can be famous, you can make money if you join up. They just joined. Uh, and then what they joined was, you know, the probably the most ragtag military that was ever put together. But they had a secret, uh, a secret power. And that was, they were all pretty much frontiersmen. And, you know, it's back to that thing when you know the terrain, when you know how to use the terrain, uh, when you are uh, when you are hardened to the elements and don't allow them to bother you, you have a huge advantage over those who don't. And that was our advantage over the Brits. But they stood up and uh, against overwhelming odds, they stood up, they stood their ground together. And, uh, you know, they're as big of heroes of human evolution as, as those caveman ancestors were. And so I feel like that's where we're at today. All of, if you believe in freedom and that's the vast majority of people on this planet, it's time to stand up. Uh, freedom of choice and freedom of speech, which is the verbal manifestation of 
freedom of choice. We choose to speak. Um, you know, our, our non-negotiables. And, uh, you know, I mentioned to you that this instinct, it's, it's not just freedom of choice. It's freedom of choice to make sense of what's going on around you and sensible choices about what to do next. That's our most inherently human right. And it begins to be taken away from you when we're told to ignore our senses, to ignore what you're seeing, feeling, hearing, uh, going on around you at any given time. And, you know, the, the, everything about the pandemic is a perfect example of that. Uh, you know, people trying to tell us that to dismiss what we know with our own senses as factual and to go instead with some version of reality that not only doesn't make sense, but is not based on our senses. Um, and, you know, that's that's the threat right now. I think it can, you know, as, as again, we're seeing, it's both international and national. Um, you know, I, I don't, I'm not calling for anything, uh, you know, any kind of action other than uh, stand our grounds, stand up for freedom. Uh, it is non-negotiable. Uh, we all need to do something, you know, big difference between us and our parents. Uh, I can talk about my hometown. My dad worked in a bank, but he came home once a week, Tuesday nights, took up his time, went to a city planning meeting. Uh, he was never paid. That was my entire childhood. Uh, and I grew up in a great town. And when I talked to my friends about it, we realized it was a great town because our dads and moms were involved in the charter of that town. What's happened today? Well, as we all commiserated about the direction our hometown went in since then, we also realized none of us uh, do what our dads did. And, you know, I've since uh, made a vow that I am uh, getting involved in my local politics here uh, at the municipal level. And I, I'm doing that right now. And I think all of us need to really ask ourselves those hard questions and go back, you know, look at it as an opportunity. It's 1775 and we're alive and we get to have a say in our own future destiny and in the destiny of our children. And we can either do nothing and allow that to be our legacy, or we can do something uh, and stand up for freedom and common sense and stand our ground and uh, make that our legacy uh, that perhaps 200 years from now, people will say, hey, I always wanted to be alive in 2020 uh, to be one of those guys. And uh, that's that's where I think we're at today. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Pete. And your point about uh, we're at a time and we're, it's a, there's a bifurcation between those that want freedom and those that want uh, some sort of totalitarian uh, authoritarian dystopia. I, I don't know what the right word for it would be, but I, I think we see the same bifurcation here in our country. Like you said, it's not just international anymore. It's actually, actually domestic as well. Mm -hmm. There are those here and, you know, maybe like you, um, a lot of my ancestors came to East Tennessee because they got uh, land grants for fighting in the revolution. Mm -hmm. So I, I take that uh, mantle of responsibility as an American you know, very seriously, as, as I'm sure you do as well, sir. Mm -hmm. so, so let me ask you this, Pete. Final question, sir. Uh, thank you again for coming on. It's been incredible. But the question I have for you, the final one is, having seen the lawlessness of the last several years, having seen the bifurcation of our country, looking into the Pete Blabber crystal ball that I'm sure they give you the guys at the unit, where is all this going and what can a reasonable, responsible, armed citizen do? Um, I think just, you know, go back to that. Don't let the issue get twisted, uh, into some emotional position. It's about freedom. Uh, it's about America is about freedom. Uh, it's the greatest country in the history of the planet. Not because, you know, we win at the Olympics or whatever, it's because we have no, we have, there's no 
ethnicity or religion that defines America. Um, the thing that defines America is freedom. People come to this country to be free. Our common purpose in America is our freedom. And uh, just stay centered on that. I don't, I don't know what's going to come next. Obviously, we have to be uh, prepared. Uh, but stay centered on freedom and, and understand uh, what's going on around you. And remember, we all make sense the same way and we all recognize senselessness the same way. And I believe that's what's happening now. Everybody's recognizing the senselessness of uh, some of these measures that are being imposed on us uh, that by default take away our freedom. So, you know, I believe we need to uh, stay together, stay united in our stance on freedom. Uh, do not ever let them divide us because part of what's going on is this attempt to divide. And, uh, you know, you'll, you'll see in my new book, there's a chapter on uh, the, the biology of our species. And the biology of our species, again, is not theoretical. It's proven uh, by the human genome uh, discovery in the year 2000. There is no genetic basis of race, religion, or nationality. Uh, we've all known that our whole lives. Uh, we can see it in action. Um, all The only thing that differentiates humans is surface features. And our surface features are natural adaptations based on where clusters of our ancestors lived over hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, and so if your ancestors lived for a long time with a cluster of other humans in a place where the sun shined every day, your skin's going to be much darker than someone who lived in a place like Europe with no sun. And that's a fact. You know, the skin pigmentation is all about vitamin D. We die without vitamin D. So uh, if we're getting too much sun, obviously, in vitamin D, then you can get cancer. So the body naturally adapts and darkens our skin. And that that goes, that's over hundreds of years and even thousands of years. Uh, and you can actually see that if you were to uh, take a picture of every person for every generation in that lineage. Um, it, it's, it's the same thing with eye shape, head shape. And again, We've always known those were just surface features. It took the human genome to prove it empirically, but we've always known it. And today in our, our interbred, totally interconnected global society, we can actually see surface features disappear in generation instead of millennial. So we can see uh, a couple from different ethnicities get together and have a baby, and then that baby get together with uh, another ethnicity and have a baby. And in two short generations, all those surface features are gone. So what race, religion, nationality is that person? They're none. They're Americans. They're freedom loving Americans. Uh, and so understanding we are one, do not allow them to create a false metaphor that we're different. We always have known that. Uh, we've always had an integrated society. Those of us in the military, uh, it's even more uh, abhorrent what they're trying to accuse uh, the military of and society in general, because we lived it, you know, and I joined the military in the 80s, as I said, and, you know, in the 80s, the motto was, we're all green. Uh, and, I, you know, until this latest thing with the Secretary of Defense and the chairman and doing the stand down and the, the retraining um, on hate, I never even thought in terms of races in the military, in my entire military career. And it was only at that time where I thought back when they said, hey, the military's, you know, not integrated. There's there's extremism uh, that's pervasive. And, you know, that made me reflect on my own career. And in just doing that, you know, I looked at my lineage, my my fantastic drill sergeant, uh, Staff Sergeant Moore was of African-American descent. My TAC officer at OCS, uh, First Lieutenant Monroe, was of African-American descent. My first First Sergeant, First Sergeant Johnson, Vietnam veteran, 
was of African American descent. And in all that time, I never ever thought of any of them that way. I just thought of them as great guys, great combat leaders, until they started saying that there is, you know, an issue in the military uh, as far as race and extremism. And, you know, we, again, need to stand up. We were all in the military, you know, for myself, 22 years, and I never saw that. And I would say it if I did. And there's another way to prove it doesn't exist. And the military proves it all the time. Uh, give anyone freedom of choice on who they want next to them. And the last thing that will ever come up is race, religion, nationality, or sex. We only care about competence, courage, common sense. And if we have those, we don't care if there's antennas sticking out of your butt. Uh, we want you to be the person next to us. And, you know, in the corporate world, we also see proof of it. If you think about all the jobs you've ever had uh, outside the military, you know, leaders are always turning over. So you can pick any company you've ever been at, any uh, endeavor, profit or non, you've worked for. And when, you know, you're around the water cooler with other employees talking about, wow, you know, we're going to get a new boss. You'll never hear anyone in that conversation, no matter what their background, no matter what their surface features say, wow, I hope the boss, I hope our new boss is a man. I hope our new boss is a woman. I hope our new boss is tall. I hope our new boss is small. I hope they have a good suntan. I hope they, you know, are whatever shade they want. We never say that. The only thing anyone ever talks about is I hope the new boss is a good person. I hope that new boss is a common sense leader. And that again shows not only are we not inherently racist, but when given a choice, no one chooses race. No one uses it as a priority for anything, especially in life or death endeavors that first responders go through all the time. And, you know, first responders set the standard back in the 40s with the integration of the military uh, and then the police forces here back home and the fire departments, and they still set that standard today. We know we're all the same and we know that humans all make sense the same way. The only differentiator is what you learn from your experiences and things like racism and uh, extremism are learned. It just like character and the characteristics that make up character are learned. So, you know, not only can you unlearn them, but uh, they're not inherent in anyone. Uh, they're certainly not in the military. Uh, the final thing I'll say about that, uh, the whole issue that the SecDef and the chairman created is, is this. It was amazing. It was the, you know, Sherlock Holmes, the dog that didn't bark what one thing didn't they talk about? You know, they made all these accusations, but there wasn't a single shred of empirical evidence that any of it exists. And the military is the most audited for integration and uh, discrimination of any government agency. Um, I did my final tour in the Pentagon and I was on a project that involved uh, a potential hate crime in combat. So I had access to all these historical reports. And uh, that was 2005. And I think at the time there was 140 recent reports auditing every type of, of unit, every service, and all finding the same thing, that there was no discrimination, no inherent racism, sexism in the military. Uh, you know, can you find an isolated example? I don't know. But all I do know is, you know, all of those studies turned up nothing. And so, you know, the proof to me was in the pudding. Though that was never brought up. Uh, lever that, you know, the military, unfortunately, is the victim of right now. It's funny you say that. I, I ask every guest that same question, Pete, and I get I get almost the same answer. And it started several months back when I interviewed Joe Saunders of the Managing Violence podcast in Australia. 
And he said, you know, the, what was the greatest threat to the to Western nations or English speaking nations, whatever the phraseology was. And he said, it's this idea of othering. And I think that speaks yeah. exactly what you're getting at and that, yeah. and that we cannot allow the othering to, to break apart what we uh, have enjoyed here. And that, you know, my 23 years in the Marine Corps, the only uh, racial extremism I ever saw happen in 1992 when I was at second battalion, second Marines and in infantry unit, and we had a group of African-American Marines in the communications platoon that that read the book Malcolm X and uh, a couple other books. And they got really motivated to take out their frustrations on white NCOs and they end up killing a couple. Hmm. And uh, and actually, Parker and Washington are still on death row at Leavenworth. So um, to, to think that extremism can only go one way, I think, is a bit of a non sequitur as well. Right. Anytime we attempt to other each other, I think is a, is a bad, bad, we start heading down a bad path. And I think that uh, your point is incredibly well made, sir. Yeah. Just remember every time they try to divide us, say it out loud. We are one. We are one species. There's no difference. You know, back to that thing on 99.99 infinity. Uh, we have one mission as a species that's to survive, thrive and evolve. We have a lot ahead of us you know we're gonna the last chapter of my book is a thought experiment on an imminent asteroid and it's it is in the book just for this reason to allow people to put themselves to do a thought experiment thought experiment happens inside the head not the lab and it's to put themselves into a context where all of our lives are on the line and it's only when we put ourselves in that context that we can think in terms of the gravity of the decisions not only we make but of what our political leaders make and if you think in terms of what we just saw which to me is a you know the greatest revelation that could have happened there's a positive side to everything we now know uh how incapable many of these politicians are of making uh greater good choices in fact we know they don't have a greater good mentality. That's the again the problem with politics. It's emotional. It has no context. It has no basis of thought and no basis of logic. There's nothing to pivot off of. It's just let's do this, let's do that. But we got to work together. We're going to be challenged, and we're one species. We're going to have one shot at it. Uh, and whether it's an asteroid or a potential nuclear war or mass volcanism we got to prepare for that day and we better start getting our muscle memory in shape right now uh collaboration is what set our species apart collaboration is working together for a common purpose uh if we don't collaborate we're never going to survive or at least we're not going to survive as a species uh, and that's just going to be because of poor decision making and problem solving by people who are just have no business in the positions they're in uh, because they are incapable of doing that. And so, you know, taking it another step, the lessons from what we just went through uh, have to be said out loud and shared with all. Uh, you know, if you're in a state uh, with one of these governors uh, who did everything counter to what made sense, you have to vow that you're going to do everything you can to never again vote for someone in for that office who doesn't have a proven track record of decision-making, problem solving and leadership. Uh, and, you know, I think in, in addition to that, uh, we also will need to look at some of these powers and how to, uh, how to pull them back so that never again, do we end up with a political governor uh, ruining, you know, and not only a state's economy, but, you know, the the hard work of small business people all across that state and in, you know, indirectly the lives of those people uh, along the way. And so, you know, to me, again, it's uh, uh, we've got to adapt. We've got to learn from it. And uh, but the future is bright. There's common sense always wins. All we have to do is stay centered uh stay strong stand up stand together and uh we will uh, common sense will win here uh, as it has throughout history 
Uh, well said. I think it's a perfect, perfect place to end it, Pete. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, sir. It's been incredibly enlightening. I enjoyed talking to you, Rich. All right, guys. Thank you for watching or thank you for listening on the podcast in the days and weeks to come. Thank you for watching the Coffee with Rich YouTube channel. A special thank you to Pete Blabber, author of the book, The Men, The, Mich the Mission, The Men and Me, as well as his upcoming book. And I'll be looking into getting my F-150 out there to add armor and uh, making my, my family a little safer. And one little correction at the end, it's Blaber, just so that all the viewers know it's the long end, not that short, but that yeah. happens all the time. Yes, sir. And uh, also all the links to all of Pete's products are in today's show notes. So you can always find them there. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. Remember, folks, the fight is coming. Be ready. <laughs>